hello welcome to pop culture maniacs podcast um this week um your host is me karen Fremantle, and uh our usual collaborator gene hennigan um this week we'll be talking about the his dark materials franchise by um philip pullman so um obviously gene and i we um uh, come from it at different places because i'm was a big fan of the books and you um were actually unfamiliar with the franchise before the t- before the TV series. Correct. Uh, my yeah. sister is a huge fan, so I've used her a little bit to help me when I was writing reviews, but I yeah. have not read the books, so I'm still yeah. completely in the dark. Yeah. Okay. I think I'll just to get things going, I think start with how I got into the franchise. Um, back in about 2002, the, the BBC did a poll for um, for, the, for the big read, so the nation's favourite books, and that's how I first really found out about the books because they did a, like for the top twenty-one. They did a, um, a little sections by celebrities who described the basics of the story. The usual content, the contenders were like things like nineteen eighty-four, Harry Potter and the Goblets of Fire, Lord of the Rings, Catcher in the Rye, War and Peace. So. Not you can make lots of mostly lots of classics. So it sounded interesting. A lot of the books were like on discount in the local bookshop, so I just thought go for it, and then I simply fell in love fell in love with the books when reading them. And in uh, obviously I was interested in the film when it did come out in two thousand. Um, uh, seven, uh, but obviously that was a massive disappointment. And obviously, been been watching the TV series. So certainly watched the first series and the second series is about to come up. Come up, though it might, uh, depending on when we public um, post the video, it might already, it might have already have started for our, for our listeners. I think um, as a non-fan for you, um, how did you gauge the first season? Um, I enjoyed uh, large elements of it. Um, I, I liked a number of the performances, um, but I was still pretty confused as to what exactly is going on. Yeah. Um, that was a, a thing I had to use my sister for a bit, was just having her explain what dust was to me, because I don't really think the show did a particularly good job explaining that to somebody who wasn't familiar uh, with it. To be honest, the novels don't really describe it very <laughs> well. I, I've, uh, basically, it's like... Um, it's. It's been compared to like chi and like, or you can think of it a bit like the force in Star Wars. Yeah, or, yeah. Once I got that kind of, and I read up a bit too, just try to figure some stuff out. Yeah. But there's definitely still some holes. I'm, I'm still confused a bit about, you know, the jumping between different, like, I don't know if they would call them worlds or universes and um, kind of how our modern world fits into the world that, Lyra and everybody is inhabiting. So yeah. got questions that I assume are going to be answered as we go along into the yeah. new series. Because uh, the books themselves are out, because they were written for young adults. They're, the first two are relatively short, about 400 pages. Um, the, the third one is the longest. It's about 500, 520, roughly. Admittedly, I think um, the problem with it being a TV series is... Um, is a bit it has to stretch out has to add a lot of elements to the um for the uh for the tv series to justify its length so 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 compared to something like game of thrones those books were like pretty much a thousand pages each roughly so you can so a tv series was probably the only format it could fit in um whilst i'm I would have preferred a mini for the film series myself. Though I, and I will, well, as a book fan, you do develop your certain picture in your mind. So if there's any deviation, you're going to be you're going to be in that extra critical because that it did make some some changes were fairly minor. Lyra's hair color was she was she had blonde curly hair in the books. Obviously, yeah, Daphne Keene in real life has. Um, has dark hair. Um, they like changed like Sophia Pekla's demon from a goose to a ho- to a falcon, but I think that was 
I think the reasons for that were a budgetary because they already had the hawk um the hawk can um see the hawk cgi ready and plus i, I think a talking goose might have been a bit ridiculous but then there are other sort of changes that did it it me a bit because um the books themselves were the world was described to be a lot more victorian i did sort of picture it quite like like victorian victorian britain sort of like the action scenes i was thinking they would have like used things like bolt action rifles think a bit like zulu if you ever seen the film or maybe a little bit of um this guy richie sherlock holmes film so really industrial kind of a steampunk vibe pretty much yeah yeah very very much so and like the uniforms they that formal soldiers were being worn, worn would have been like 19th century so you know bright brightly colored uniforms so red for british blue for russia that kind of thing and obviously the big thing about the books is it is their religious themes which it is sort of the um, thing that that's what really killed the film in the because the studio wanted to tr but the studio new line cinema they did not want they didn't want to annoy middle america relig bible belt um people so they sort of muted the religious themes but um the um the, so but they ended up annoying two sets because those lot were never going to be interested in his dark materials anyway and you upset the big the fan base at the same time which which really affected its box office yeah that's just the horrible idea nobody in the bible belt's going to be reading his dark materials or watching his dark materials yeah, yeah exactly and i it was, uh, I was excited for a tv series i think for the most part i did enjoy it I, the first, three, I think, I said the problem with the length was the first three episodes really could have been cut down to about 30 to 45 minutes. Really. Um, and then uh, it, I, it, it, it picked up when it went, when they got to the um, Arctic Circle. So, you know, so the episode at Harmon with um, where they get the um, Iron, oh, Iron Bronson's. Um, um, armor. My favorite episode was the fifth episode when it was in um, when they uh, with the child. Even if they did make a few changes uh, to it, I think that was the best episode for me. With you know, showing how dark the story would get, because it has um, um, children literally having their souls ripped off, ripped away from them, dying because of the trauma. Uh, that was the biggest shock for me is I had no idea that they were going to be just killing children like I was yeah. shocked that this is a children's book that <laughs> but I mean it made it all the more powerful to, yeah. to have yeah. that happen oh. yeah and exact, exactly uh, and I think one thing the book this tv series did a lot better than the f books was describing what happened Sort of like showing they said that the nurses were a bit off in the um, Bolvanga in the books they in the fit sorry in the TV series they they you actually got to see that they were it was a lot more easy easy for them to actually show show it because she was a bit uh, the nurses were a bit cold distance because they were they've all been cut from their demons yeah that was. I mean, once they got into that aspect of it, where, you know, we weren't just getting the exposition and it was kind of woven into the story, I, I found myself enjoying the, the show a lot more once there's actually things happening and action and characters that I can understand how yeah. they related to each other. Yeah. It is quite amazing how some of the, the caliber of the people they've actually got involved with it because obviously Daphne Keane was known for doing Logan. And he's obviously got big name supporting cast, James McElvoy and uh, Ruth Wilson in two of the major roles. It, lots of actors were established, uh, have established careers. I think James Cos Cosmos as, um, he, I think he was amazing casting for, uh, 
for his role. So I've forgotten his character name. Yeah, he was he was sensational. I mean, uh, I, I, especially that um, scene where I think he described what happened between him and Sophia Pekala oh, and yeah. and uh, say no because their son their son died. He, um, what else? So yeah, and they even got like some fairly big names for sort of rather small roles. So they had um, uh, Georgina um, Campbell, probably best known for um, for one of the, uh, what's the uh, Shut Up and Dance. Not is it that one? No, Hang the DJ. She was known for the Hang the DJ episode in um, Black Mirror. She, it was a really small role they got her for as the journalist. And he, um, and he got uh, uh, on. I mean, I'm sure Julia. I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, he's a big stand-up comedian. He was again um, very got a very small role in the um, in the t in the film, TV series. Well, I'm excited and hopeful that Andrew Scott actually gets to do something in, in the new series. Yes, I don't want to know. I don't want to know, but I'll, I'm hoping I'll, he does. Yeah, yeah, he he will. Don't he will? He okay, does. Good. He comes. He does become a lot more important. They just because admittedly uh, that was one of the big surprises for me in the TV show that they introduced like Will Parry so early. I thought it was just they they just announced they got him cast ready for the second season. I didn't realize they would they would do so much, and I think mean, that. Add, I can understand maybe adding a bit more of that stuff for the TV series, showing his his background. Though they have aged him up because in the TV series they say he's fifteen, when in the books he's actually thirteen, and that is going to be, I think, an issue when the TV series progresses. Um, because um, because obviously the books they don't the way I read it. They see, it seems to take the story itself takes place over a few weeks. Obviously, actors, um, especially of that age, can age and grow a lot more quickly. Yeah, that's and especially now with the pandemic, you know, yeah. if there's a third series, they're gonna have to wait a while yeah. before they can really get everything back in place for that. And they already the pandemic's already had an effect because James McAvoy was meant to have a bigger role in the second series, but he because of it they can film it all, so they've actually cut the series length from seven eight episodes to seven. So, and I suspect my theory will be that they're gonna just kind of interweave some of the stuff they've already filmed into the other other episodes just to show the build up of his rebellion. That would make sense, yeah. Yeah, just because there's no point wasting what they what they've got. And um, I for the webs for Pop Culture Maniacs website, obviously, listeners, go out and check it out. It's bloody, it's very good. And um, I wrote an article about what to expect for the second season, and so like they they have already cast character. They've cast characters who don't really come into prominence until the third third book so it's um so i would they've already cast characters that will be prominent in the third book so i favor that they're going to have a more expanded role in the second series they've also got like bella um ramsey who obviously is best in, oh, best known for game of thrones and the worst witch she's um set to play a character that was very minor in the books so, so my theory is that they're going to expand her role and they've already got Terry Stamp as well for, for I believe, for an episode or two. That's the Guardian of the Subtle Knife. Just knowing that Bella Ramsey is going to be in it makes me even more excited. Yeah. I love her. Yeah, yeah, she is, she is incredible. She, won, um, she was one of the few good things from Holmes and Watson. I think it's just because she looked, at least looked like she was having fun. And I would say because of the... The TV series, they have been able to incorporate a few more elements from, because Philip Pullman has written a sequel trilogy, or written two of the three books for a sequel trilogy, The Book of Dust. I read, because um, the first episode actually opens with uh, the prologue of the flood, was a, that was basically showing the events of, um, of the first book of the Book of Dust series. Because there was no mention of of the flood in the um, in the original novel series, 
or anything about scholastic sanctuary. So, there it. I want to admit, we're reading the sequel trilogy because the first three books they were written as said for like young adult plus, so I'd say twelve plus. So it's a bit weird reading the sequel trilogy when it has things like characters saying the F word or like having a rape scene. It was pretty disconcerting, really. Well, that sounds very, very different. Yes, it, yeah, yeah, it is. And since the, um, I'd say the problem for the, the book, the original trilogy, it's literally about saving the fabric of reality. So, um, Everything after that just seems a bit small scale. Yeah, I mean, once you've saved the fabric of reality, what else is there left to do? Yeah. And, um, and obviously reading the sequel trilogy as well, because they bring in certain elements and you're thinking, as I said, with um, his dark materials, think for me, in the the property has grown beyond the author, a bit like how Harry Potter's grown beyond J.K. Rowling or Star Wars grew beyond George Lucas. The fans develop their own ideas and if, uh, and so, cause some of the things I didn't like, just these were just like small details. Like there was like mentions of people like Mozart and, and Napoleon in La Lara's world. And you're thinking, sure, I can accept like the countries, the geography being the same, but because so the world's so radically different, why would there be similar figures and just some small, just some small, just small details, really? Yeah, that would. I never even thought about them having you know similar figures in in their world that we have in ours. That's I don't know. That kind of takes away some of the magic for me. Yeah. If you have the same people. Because well, we're because. Britain in this world is not as democratic because the king still has a lot of power and influence than in the, than in say oh because of say, in Victorian Britain Victorian Britain the Queen Queen Victoria was just a figurehead it was Parliament and Prime Minister that had all the power back so I don't know if you go for a whole historical way about how democratic Britain was but basically Parliament and Prime Minister probably still even with flawed, of, um, flawed of elect, um, limited electorate, still more democratic than king or queen. And those, I think, so we all talk about um, Philip Pullman because um, he's very forthright with his opinions, and um, well, he's a very he's a vocal atheist. The books are pretty much um, go go for uh, well. The, that the theme is bringing down organized religion, bringing down the powers of um, of heaven. Because Azrael's his um, his rebellion, he he, called, he says he wants to set up the republic of heaven, not the kingdom of heaven, for a star. But yeah, he is obviously one of the big criticisms of the books. I think even if is um, Pullman is trying to enforce his um, own atheist. Um, opinions in a children's story. Personally, I think, uh, and well, it's fine if he's an atheist. I do think the irony is um, some people who are atheists, they complain about, um, you know, organized religion enforcing their beliefs, not realizing they're doing the same about their beliefs. And as, as, as someone who is a small child reading the um, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe Narnia series, and thinking that Susan was just the coolest darn character in the whole books, only to find out <laughs> that she doesn't get to go back to Narnia at the end because she stopped believing in Narnia. I don't mind so much when an atheist wants to put their viewpoints in a, in a children's fantasy novel, since we've gotten so many on the other yeah. side of things, so. Yeah, he's, that's the thing. He is very forthright in his opinions of um, J. Uh, J.R. Tolkien and um, C. C.S. Lewis, because he, there are seen some quotes by Pullman. He criticised C.S. Lewis by saying that his answer was simply God. God will say, um, will f find an answer or something on that lines. Whereas he complained about J.R. Tolkien that his books had nothing to say, and 
you know, you, yes, I know you, Philip, I know you're a smart man. You went to Oxford as well, but maybe a little humidity might, wouldn't go amiss. No, you, you're not wrong there. Yeah. But, yeah. Admittedly, my, because uh, I don't, as a filmmaker, well, my dream project would have been to uh, make would have been to make my own adaptation of his dark materials. But yeah, I think even if I became real, even if I became a really famous filmmaker, I think it'd be very unlikely that it will ever happen now, considering considering the TV series and you know Hollywood's apprehension of making anything with an atheist um, viewpoint uh, like that. I would say this though, but. Well, I have known people with like religious views, and they perfectly enjoy his dark materials as a fancy story. So, I think it's only as all like the hard, really hard line religious people that won't like it, won't like the series. Yeah, I think you know most people, regardless of where they stand in, in religious beliefs, can put that aside and enjoy a, a good, interesting story. Yeah. Because uh, uh, going back to the film as well, because that was, um, to be honest, the production of that film actually sounds more interesting than the film itself because it went through a lot of directors, lots of writers before they even got to making the um, to the uh, to making the film because they had like uh, they offered it to Ridley Scott, he said no. Sam Mendes was attached to do it again, he um, but he got kicked. He got kicked off the series. Um, like Chris Weiss, who ended up writing and directing it, he was like on, off, on, off. Tom, they had a screenplay by Tom Stoddard. Uh, Stoddard. He was a big um, playwright in the UK, and his was um, rejected. Uh, so, a Tom Stoppard version of this would have been so cool. Yeah. And so weird. Yeah. Then, I think it was meant to be like a, free, it would have been like a three hour long film because this screenplay was so long. I'm not surprised. And, um, so yeah. Uh, well, so I, mean, I think for quite a while I blamed it on, I think, you know, because you get that sort of, at you when you're in your early 20s, you get that sort of angry fanboy rage. Uh, if, and you try and find one specific person to blame. I blamed it on Chris Vice, but then, Really, it was probably the produ production that really hampered it. I don't think Chris Weiss was the right director, but at least he, I would say he got the look more closer to our white picture than, than the TV version. Still don't understand why they changed the order of events. I would say Eva Green was perfect casting as Sophia Pekala. Eva Green is just good in everything. Yeah. Yeah, she. And again, uh, uh, when we we wrote for uh, another website, uh, because with one article I wrote was like my dream cast. Um, I uh, merely my my picks were like Michael Fassbender as um, Lord Asriel. I was close, they because they did cast cast another X Men actor. It just uh, picked the wrong one. Yeah, and. Uh, um, Obviously, I'm. This was like I said, dream casting, money, no object. Like Alicia Vikander as um, Sophia Pekala, and uh, I think to be really, you should go for a Finnish actress, really. But that's a by the by. No, oh, um, Richard E. Grant as Lord Boreal as well, but because that was one of the, probably one of the biggest changes in the books from the books is um, Lord. Bo Boreal in the TV series as a much younger man. And um, they showed that in the books, he had established himself for quite a long time, hopping between, hopping between worlds. He was so established that he was a British civil servant. He was a spy, very wealthy in our world as well. And uh, in the TV show, he shows that he's sort of only, it's only been fairly recently that he's been traveling in and out of our out of worlds yeah to me he's as someone who doesn't know really kind of the the lineage of that character he to me is the most interesting element of the story because he's such a wild card 
Yeah, yeah. I don't think, um, obviously, if, if I said if I did it, if I made the series, I would have made it a bit differently, but obviously that's just wishful thinking. I, I will really admit it. And as I said before, before when you if when you're a big fan of something you get your own ideas and if some if there's too much deviation you do get a bit you're probably more critical than you really should be obviously i think the other thing with obviously the tv show is like the most expensive tv show a british tv show ever i think it costs about the fir first season cost about 40 million pounds or 40 million dollars but i think even then it certain budget and there are some budgetary limitations because when like the characters first arrived in Norway it quite clearly was not an arctic town uh, arctic circle town they filmed it on a beach in Wales it's then and and certain things well, and like Bolvanga was a much more extensive site than it was in the um in the TV show, it was all much more claustrophobic, and well, it was also directed by a guy who had a lot of experience in Doctor Who. It felt a bit like a bit Doctor Who, like really. Yeah, it definitely did. Now that you mention it, I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah, and as I think, the way it makes me think of that, as I said, some things you do think in the back of your mind that was what did they make that decision more because of budget than artistic well if it's already so expensive i you know going on location would have only made it worse so yeah i had yeah. have to be budgetary yeah yeah because yeah. I think the other big um, change, one of the other big changes was how Lee Scoresby was portrayed because in the film version, it was, he was portrayed by Sam Elliott, which character-wise, I think he was closer to how he was in the book. But he was a lot older when in the, uh, in the for the TV show, it was quite a big coup that they got um, Lynn, what's it, Lynn Manuel, how do you pronounce his name? Lynn Manuel Miranda. Lynn Manuel, thank you. That is obviously a big coup that they got someone like him because his star is rising for fast. But his character seems a bit much more jovial than he was in the books. He was a much more serious character in the um, books. Yeah, I mean, that's what I heard when I, you know, questioned my sister about the cast and she said, it, that's, he's not, he's not, uh, like, that's not who it is. But, you know, and Lynn was interesting. You know, his accent was interesting. He claimed he was doing a very specific Texas accent and it really didn't sound that much like an accent. But I don't know. I don't know what to think about Lynn Manuel's portrayal. I wasn't sold. I think my favorite bit was just this very small bit where it was in the fifth episode where I think it was more like the book version when Lyra comes home um, uh, with. Uh, with the Costa kid, co comes to the gym, telling him camp with the Costa kid, and he said like, um, he, he sort of takes her, takes her away because he um, he know that he's she's seen a lot of dark stuff that night. She didn't need to see any more. So because he was sort of more of a like a far in the books, he was sort of more of a father figure. He even says like he, he's like the it, it, like a daughter he never had because he never had kids. So yeah, that intrigues me because I wasn't quite sure what type of relationship they were going for, whether it was like more of like a mentor or a father figure. And when they've, you know, de-aged some of the other characters to make them younger, I suppose you had to de-age him as well to kind of have him fit within the the setup that they have with, with Ruth Wilson and James McAvoy since they're all about the same age. Yeah. This is, um, is he changing the subject a tiny bit? Well, not a tiny bit, changing the subject to a big bit. It's all like the effect it's had on uh, filming in Wales because you know, it, um, I wouldn't be surprised if his Dark Materials has a similar um, has a similar effect to like what Game of Thrones did to North for the Northern Ireland film industry to give it a massive boost. Obviously, people um, build up um, various things like effects houses, editing houses, 
make more crews getting to live um getting work there because because um it's because the studios was specially built in um in um, near cardiff wells is already um quite popular for filming things like doctor who and um a whole and casualty which is regular long-running soap in um in the uk so, so yeah and just and um, maybe because i've some contacts in the in the with the bristol film scene and knowing that some people do get get work in in wells part on these sort of quite big big shows yeah i mean that's that's always great to kind of expand the uh the reach of yeah. the local <clears throat> local film community and uh with as well um basically the uh, well it used to be owned by pinewood but they sold the they sold the studio um in in wells but essentially his dark materials have got have got it for for all its seasons so at least it's got they it can't it's going to be used for a few years that's good yeah that'll be that'll be helpful yeah yeah i think um for a more broader point because um since um game of thrones um everyone's been sort of scrambling to find their next fantasy uh, franchise so obviously bbc and hbo doing his dark materials i think it's good uh, let's see i know they're going to be fit there's already got lord of the rings and wheel of time i've got um tv series shared one on and if you think there's anything and there's got to be some more ya kind of fancy as well because netflix is doing the live action versions like last airbender and um i think there there were talks of a narnia tv series as well for netflix yeah yeah i mean i i like the idea of of you know branching out into you know tv series as long as it's not telling the exact same story like i don't know if we need another line which in the wardrobe and i'm hopeful that since the Lord of the Rings isn't specifically the Lord of the Rings, it's more of the ancillary yeah. stuff from the Cimmerillion, that it's going to be better than just giving us another rehash of, of something we've already seen in a different form. But there's definitely a part of me that wants these studios to start investing in more original stories. Like, you don't have to get the next Lord of the Ring or the next Game of Thrones by buying up IP that somebody else owns. You know, you can get writers who can create these crazy worlds. I would say something like with Game of Thrones, perhaps it's best a good idea to wait for the author to actually finish writing the uh, project before me trying to make an adaption of it. Oh, God, yes. And possibly even wait till they're dead so you don't have to worry about them writing additional things that are going <laughs> to change everything. Um, obviously, go ahead. I remember what I was going to say now. Uh, admittedly, my casting for Lee Schoolsby would have been Alan Tur Turek, you know, from Firefly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's it, it's delightful. Yeah, I, and he's actually Texan. He's from El Paso. Yeah, and he's got uh, a good amount of, um, like, uh, fandom around him. So he wouldn't Sorry. necessarily have gotten as big mass appeal as Lynn has in, in the States, at least. But you would have you would have made the, uh, the fandom happy. Yeah. And I would go back to, I think my problem with, say, James McAvoy, obviously a very talented actor, but I don't think he was right for um, Lord Asriel. He doesn't, I know he has, play, he has played dark roles in the past, but it's sort of more of a, he's sort of, more, when he does do those dark roles, they're sort of, they sort of play up on his, sort because of, he's quite boyish in his look. And he's, it's always sort of, even when he's dark, he's, he diffuses the people with like his sort of kind exterior. Hence why I think First Bender would have been a better fit. I know, uh, and with, when they did cast McElroy, he was a, he was a, a last minute replacement because they, he, I remember him being interviewed on the radio and he said like, he, 
because they had like about two or three other actors for the role. For whatever reason, they dropped out. They never revealed who they were. And so he was pretty much last minute, do you fancy doing it? He goes, yeah, why not? Yeah, I mean, I had a similar take on James McAvoy when I initially started watching it. I just assumed that it was going to be a typical James McAvoy performance where you're lulled into a false sense of security because it's James, Mac James McAvoy and he's, you know, boyishly handsome and he's smiling and he's, you know, nice. And then he was going to turn on a dime and become this villainous character. And I never really saw that transformation. So I wasn't quite sure where they were going with him as the character. Uh, as I said, that's why I think Michael Fassbender would have been my, my preferred choice because I think he, he can do that sort of, he can do he can be like really intense. He does. You can picture him having that sort of like rage behind him. If that he, if you crossed him, he he could he could punch you in the face if you if you crossed him too much. Oh yeah, absolutely. He would have been just menacing enough to put you off a bit when you first see him. Yeah. So I think the. Um, I would say final point with the, the with, I would say with the book because I as I know we already touched on it with Game of Thrones, at least there would be an end point with his dark material materials because I don't think they'll do a third. At most, I think they'll do a fourth season. Just they might split the last book into two. But I think three would be the right number. It's whether they'll do. Um, do a series based on the Book of Dust afterwards would be as a spin-off series. Oh gosh, there's a spin-off series coming. That would be, <laughs> that'd be a lot. But yeah. I suspect that's probably their goal. I mean, HBO needs big, you know, appointment TV shows. They are, you know, doing great with more of their art house shows right now, but they need something big. Uh, something a bit more mainstream as well. Yeah. I thought they, I think they wanted Lovecraft Country to be that, but I don't think it caught on the way they hoped. So if they can get his dark materials and a sequel out of it, they'll be set. Yeah. Uh, how popular is his, because I would say it's pretty popular, it was pretty popular in the UK, but how popular was it in the US? So from more of a mouth standpoint, I didn't know anybody who watched it. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I don't think it was particularly popular compared to other HBO yeah. like big shows. I see, I see. Because um, within the UK, it's, it's got quite a plum slot on. It's on BBC One at about like eight-ish, yeah. so a pretty much a t prime, time, prime time slot. Um, and I, I suppose the books are probably more, more popular here than they were in America. Yeah, and I'm slightly older than uh, the age that people uh, who really got into the books here. They're about you know three or four years younger than me. Were really, really into them. Yeah. But um, let me see if I can pull up some of the ratings. Yeah. <laughs> so like just looking at the numbers off Wikipedia, you know, you had nine, almost ten million for the. Uh, pilot in the UK and then 0.42 so 400,000 well and compared to in the US. US yeah Yikes. yeah so definitely not very popular here yes. comparatively yeah I don't know if the thing is they would invest that sort of money because they would want it to be an international hit well yeah I mean and since it's on HBO, if you don't have HBO, since the paid cable network here, um, you if you have it, then you might as well watch it. But if you don't have HBO, I, this is not a show that's going to make people want to go out and buy HBO. I see, I see. And then, I know I'm reiterating the same point again, but I do think the first, even as a fan of the book, I think the first three episodes did suffer because... It did feel like a real. It, it did feel like a real dragging it out. Yeah. Yeah, but um, well, as I said, season two is upon us. Let's 
let's see how it goes. It should there should there is lots of dark there is lots of stark stuff, lots of um, s uh, lots of pl subplots to get um, to sink our teeth into, lot um, uh, new characters. So see see how it goes. Yeah, I'm excited to uh, to see it, even if it's a week after all of you in the UK get it. Yeah. Well, if the buzz is good, you'd assume it would be good for it in the US, since we are. But anyway. Oh, man. You, yeah. the, sec the first episode airs on the 16th, so you get the first two before we get even one. Yeah. Wow. Because it's tr is it shown on a Monday in the US? Yep, Monday night. Ah, I see. I see. So on that point, I think we shall call it a wrap today. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please like uh, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to the YouTube channel, check out our awesome articles. Um, hope to hit, um, we'll join you again soon. Cheers. Bye.